Hello and welcome to CSU at Home. My name is Andrew Patrick. I'm the Director of Political Communications for the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. Uh, today we are talking with some of the organizers from some of the great organizations that we partner with and work with uh, through our sister organization, the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. I want to welcome Eolanda Evans of Protect Minnesota, uh, Deja Gardner of uh, WAVE, which is the Wisconsin Anti-Violence, uh, Anti-Violence, uh, what, what am I missing? Effort. Effort. <laughs> Effort. Uh, Dijanae Talley of Ceasefire PA in Pennsylvania. Uh, and who works with us at the Educational Fund uh, to Stop Gun Violence in Virginia, Latanya Wallace. I want to thank you guys so much for being here with us. Thank you. So let's get started. Since it's 2020, it has been a year for everybody uh, with COVID and with the, the reckoning on social justice that we've seen uh, in this nation this year. Um, how has this year and what has happened uh, since March really impacted your work uh, in addressing and preventing gun violence and um, with uh, especially uh, Protect Minnesota and WAVE that you've been the epicenter of some of these uh, instances that have driven this uh, drive for social justice. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about that and, and the work that you're doing uh, in this arena. Let's start with Ayalanda. All right, good afternoon. Um, yeah, Minnesota, Minneapolis, um, and St. Paul, the Twin Cities area has been so heavily impacted um, by COVID and by violence, by community violence. There's just been so much going on in the community. Um, and it's been, um, it's been nonstop. We have had these um, incidences of police violence and we've also seen a huge uptick in community interpersonal violence as well. And so it's really caused the community to find ways to try and safely mobilize around um, the issues that we're experiencing in the community. Um, and so it's unfortunate because we've seen a lot of our frontline workers um, contract COVID in the midst of fighting for more peaceful spaces, um, you know, within and across the state. Um, so our anti-violence efforts as a collective, not just as Protect Minnesota, but as a collective has looked like making sure that people have food, making sure that people have diapers, you know, for their children, making sure that people have transportation. When a lot of our businesses were burnt down and looted, it, it made it to where there were a lot of people that didn't have access to medications. And so there was a lot of and still is really a lot of mobilizing around that. Um, our grocery stores were burnt down. So making sure that their people had access to food, like just trying to get those essentials taken care of. And then also deploying more boots on the ground workers to diffuse the, um, the interpersonal community violence that we've seen. So there's been a lot more groups of people who have been working towards maintaining the peace. Um, in, in a lot of different ways, but in and throughout the community. Some of them are paid, some of them are not paid. Some of them are mothers and cousins and uncles who are like, look, y'all, we gotta do something, you know? And so we've seen a lot of community just stepping up and filling in the gap in, in so many, so many different ways. Um, with Protect Minnesota, it's really kind of forced us to look at our work from a different perspective and what is needed in order to drive toward community safety. Um, one of the initiatives that we started this summer was um, getting trigger locks out to firearm owners. And, um, and so we've been doing that really heavily, making sure, especially people who have children in the house have access to, um, to trigger locks for handguns. And then we've also, receive dollars to provide biometric safes to families living specifically in North Minneapolis um, so that they can have more levels of safety if they do have firearms in the home. And so we've been, um, along with everyone else, have been really forced to find more innovative out of the box ways to continue to do our work and drive toward a reduction in gun violence in our communities in the midst of COVID. That's, I mean, you're absolutely right. That's kind of what We've been talking about what are the resources, Deja, like 
in this effort, and you also with Kenosha and what happened there, uh, it's been a big impact, but like what resources are you looking for to help in your work, in your effort, uh, and help address gun violence and just stop the, uh, not only in itself, but also address the root causes of violence that, that are driving this? Um, well, I think that, you know, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge a lot of the systemic issues that exist and have existed for a really long time. Um, and, and what usually happens in, in, in pandemics or, or, you know, periods of, of when people go through a tremendous amount of, of heartache and, and when they go through, through a tremendous amount of stress and when they are facing these financial crises, we see and we know historically that um, the likelihood of violence goes up. In, in communities that are more stressed by, by the lack of resources. And so when we talk about um, resources, um, you know, to, get, to be quite frank and just be a little blatant about it, money is always a good thing for people to have, of course. Um, and so as we've been trying to figure out how to tackle some of the problems that we've seen with the interpersonal violence as well as with the state sanctioned violence, um, we've really been focusing on budgets. We've been focusing on allocating resources appropriately. We've been looking at things from a you know multi-million dollar perspective and, and seeing how um, things are funded disproportionately, and that some of the there's there's evidence that you know proves that you know when people have access to community resources, they have access to adequate housing, they have access to um, assistance during pandemics, um, it proves that, you know, there are things that prove that, you know, gun violence rates do go down and they do decrease. However, there has been a sheer lack and disregard of the, the needs of, of folks. And like, and I've seen that, you know, in, instead of, we're seeing the uptick in, in violence, but instead of addressing it from a community, you know, facing perspective, a lot of folks will look at it from a law and order perspective. And so as an organization, we really have just been trying to shift the narrative, um, making sure that we are signing on and helping to create policy and legislation um, that adequately, you know, delegate or uh, gets resources where they need to be. And, and I think that um, that's, that's really the, the key here is that we're going through a tremendous amount of again, hardship as a country, as a community, um, especially for black folks, it's been extremely hard during this pandemic and, and they need resources. People need um, capita, they just they just do, so. Yeah, it's, um, the pandemic just kind of exacerbated all these like, uh, like all these root causes that have gone not talked about by politicians, by leaders from local levels to, to federal levels. And um, it is laid bare the inequities that are, that are structurally put in and laying a gun on top of those inequities has increased like violence in these communities. When really, if you're investing in housing, you're investing in schools, you're investing in uh, healthy food, healthy, I, I, there, you can go down the list. Um, it's been underfunded and a lack of investment that we're working and I'm working with uh, Ari and, and Lauren at our organization to change uh, and Latanya. It's, it's something, where, where do you want to go with these efforts? What is the next step in, in continuing this work to address gun violence, uh, Latanya, in, in Virginia? Um, just to piggyback off what Deja was speaking about um, is going in the direction of policy creation and uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, are you, is it Ayelanda? <laughs> okay. Um, and just making sure that um, along with that policy, we want to, uh, I just lost my whole train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, Basically, what I'm doing in the community is looking at budgets. Um, I'm looking at the money that's being allocated for our police department versus the money that's being allocated for community resources. And what we're looking to do is redirect funds where we can make cuts 
and redirect those into services that will address the trauma and uh, address mental health and provide wraparound services for families that are living in communities with a high propensity towards violence, whether it's gun violence in a domestic violence situation or gun violence in the street violence type of nature uh, situation. I know living here in Newport News and Hampton, um, we had a, a uptick in violence and COVID-19 doesn't assist with that. You know, um, we already have communities that are lacking in resources. And when you have a pandemic, like you stated, layered on top of that, and it's already a disparity in place, it just exasperates the si situation. Um, what we've been working on primarily is educating our community members, getting them equipped with the tools, with the knowledge necessary. So when the General Assembly opens up in January, we can come ready to talk about policy, to talk about what does it look like to truly eradicate gun violence in our communities, especially when you're talking about low income communities with a high concentration of poverty, because it just looks different. And um, so the approach and the uh, solutions are gonna be different. So we are capacity building and we are engaging on an intergenerational level so we can have multiple perspectives and conversations come into that policy making room and table. That's, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, Dijanae, um, what challenges are you facing in uh, Pennsylvania? Like what, right, we've talked about resources, but what else you, and what, what do you need to, to uh, meet those challenges? If I can say like the, the challenges that we're facing now um, that are just really distinct to me, um, my role at Ceasefire PA is primarily um, youth organizing um, around gun violence prevention. And so like all of you stated here, it's really difficult. You, you I, won't even, I won't even say you almost can't, you absolutely cannot have a conversation about ending gun violence um, when COVID and this, this pandemic has made it so blatantly clear. I don't think that, you know, it's a mistake. I don't think that it's a coincidence that in the same year that we're seeing massive unemployment, people are getting sick, businesses are closing. Um, we had the Walter Wallace um, tragedy here in Philadelphia, that all of all of those things are happening at the same time that we're seeing almost an unprecedented level of gun violence here in Philly that we haven't seen, you know, in a really, really long time. Um, we're over 400 homicides here, over 1,800 shootings. And um, we cannot have a conversation about ending gun violence without talking about housing insecurity, food insecurity, and all the things that have been made that we all knew were there before, right? But this is just, a, it's a different, it looks different now. It's, it's, it's much more pronounced um, and more tragic, I'd say, just because even the, the physical distancing, organizing with young people, it's hard to get you on a call in a meeting and to be motivated about ending gun violence when you don't have a rec center, you don't have activities, your your parents may be out of work or, you know, there's so many things to balance that on the list of priorities, everything is a priority. And, you know, talking about conflict resolution, talking about policy in Harrisburg, that's not sitting at the top. Um, so it's like, I had a student say to me, I don't care about anything. And when we dug deeper into that, it wasn't that you don't care about anything, there's so much to care about. It's like, where do I start? How do you prioritize eating, living, not getting sick, and not being afraid to walk down your street? How do you pick something out of that, right? For yourself, but also for the people around you who you love. And so that's the challenge is the messaging and how can we make a message and how can we mobilize people and how can we get people invested um, without feeling like we're not doing a disservice to any of these very, very, very important issues. Um, and so it, it takes a certain level, I think, of care and compassion and acknowledgement of how messy and just totally unacceptable all this is um, and being really intentional about that. You can't just walk up to somebody and say, you know, we want to we want to propose this lost and stolen policy in Harrisburg. We have to have these other conversations. We have to talk about the schools. We have to talk about people's living situations. We have to talk about employment. There's just it's just no way around it. And I think that the messaging for us, at least, is that the coalition building, the capacity building in the community, that togetherness that we're all on the same page about these five things need to happen for us to move the needle. Like, I think that togetherness is most important to us. We have a Philadelphia organizer. We have folks who are just 
getting connected to people, doing some education with young people about root causes, um, and just trying to build that. The way I like to say is like, if you can name your monster, you can face it. A lot of people know that there's a lot of mess going on, but can't really like, you know, zero in on, on what and what what's causing the mess and all the pieces that are causing the mess. It makes sense of them. So then it doesn't seem as big, even though it's huge, but to be able to attack it in a very tactical way, because now you know what the moving parts are. I think that's been the approach. And of course, like I said, the barriers are just everyone is, is, is stretched very, very, very thin, more than we've ever been uh, in our personal lives and in our professional lives and working in gun violence and knowing that it's, it's never just about the guns. We want to get the guns. Um, but we also have to invest in these other things that, you know, the policy can't always be about a firearm. <laughs> Sometimes the policy is invest in, in rec, invest in recreation, give kids things to do. And that's not the conversation that everybody, when people want to attack gun violence, it's really easy to go to the guns when really we, we need to be having a, com a more comprehensive conversation about these other pieces. And so it's, it's just balancing all that, I think is the challenge. But I think, you know, the more you can craft that message and make people feel heard and acknowledged and all the other things that are going on outside of gun violence, the more that you can get people to buy into, we can attack all of these things and get at the gun violence if we just think about it more holistically. So <sighs> trial and error. <laughs> so, you know, we're working on it. And that is why the work that all of you are doing is so important and why the work of, of state groups in this effort is so important. And as a national group, the educational fund be able to work with you uh, and partner with you and listen to you and and, and learn from you uh, in your communities is a, like extremely important and a, a big part of the work that we're trying to do and convey. I want to thank you guys all uh, for taking the time today. Uh, today is Giving Tuesday. I'm going to try to get this out uh, on our YouTube today, but I want to encourage anyone who's watching this to please support uh, Protect Minnesota wave uh, in wisconsin ceasefire pa and our sister organization the educational fund to stop gun violence so thank you again keep up the good work uh and and really uh really take care i really appreciate it